Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on this really nice Saturday afternoon uh, to have a conversation with this group of our assembly women. My name is Alyssa Hunt. I am the program director at the Alice Paul Institute. And with me today are Assemblywoman Carol Murphy, Berlina Reynolds Jackson, Gabriela Mosquera, and Ora Dunn. And we are so honored to have them here with us and so excited for them to share their experiences. So um, this is part of our second Saturday programming series and that series is generally su generously supported by Comcast NBC Universal. Um, they give us institutional support so that we can have these platforms to bring this programming to you. And um, so today we're gonna be talking about women in politics. And at the end, I will review these really exciting upcoming events we have this month. So um, really without further ado, um, I would just love to uh, get going and invite our assembly women to introduce themselves to you. Assemblywoman Mosquera. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, thank you so much to the Alice Paul Institute for inviting me. This is a uh, for Women's History Month. Um, just a little bit about who I am. Uh, I am a, a state representative from the fourth legislative district representing uh, parts of uh, Camden County and parts of uh, Gloucester County. I've been in the state legislature since uh, 2012, and I am currently serving as the uh, chair of women and children, and I sit on the appropriations committee. Um, as um, an elected official, uh, these are two very important uh, committees, um, in uh, my opinion. <laughs> I know my colleagues serve on other amazing uh, um, committees as well, very important committees as well, but I have been, I. I think I've been very um, honored and, um, and humbled actually to be uh, appointed to these uh, committees, uh, especially leading the Women and Children's Committee, being the chair of that, um, which I would um, say that I do bring um, a lot of issues to the forefront of the conversation that generally probably are not uh, talked about in everyday conversations. Um, and I guess we'll just go into that in further of our, in, you know, as we go along, progress through our conversation here today. But, um, and then of course I sit in the appropriations committee, which uh, basically doles out money <laughs> for programs that are very dear and near to our hearts here in the state of New Jersey, programs that are important to women, programs that are important to uh, children and family um, as a whole. Um, so thank you again for uh, allowing me to participate in, in today's program, and I look forward to having a great dialogue with amazing women that I serve with. Thank you, Assemblywoman Reynolds Jackson. Good afternoon, everyone. And I too want to just thank the Alice Paul Institute. And I love your theme of education, empowerment, and equity, um, equality. Um, you know, I grew up in the city of Trenton and I am a big YWCA girl where their mission is all about empowering women and eliminating racism. So I felt that those two programs definitely mesh together when we talk about uplifting women and continuing on. Um, I represent the 15th legislative district, uh, Trenton being the largest of them, but I've also have 10. And so uh, 10 other towns. So that's Trenton, Ewing, Lawrence, West, um, West Windsor, uh, East Amwell, West Amwell, Hopewell Township, Hopewell Borough, Pennington, and Lambertville. And so I did it. I did all 10. Um, and it's an amazing opportunity. I started off in local government. Well, let me even back up a little bit before that. I started off just wanting to be a part of a board. Um, and so I went out and I started look, looking for, I had recently graduated from college and I was looking for a board or a commission to join. And fast forward, you know, almost 10 years later, I'm in the legislature. I grew up on Wilkinson Place, which is two blocks from the state house. My district office, I can see my mom's back door. And if you would have told me as a child that I would be serving in the New Jersey legislature, I would say that you were absolutely crazy. 
living uh, my best life. I am doing, I call it God's work. I feel like I am definitely a public servant and I'm just doing the work of the people. I feel like I am the super advocate. And if there's a need or one out there, I'm going to be that person to help you find it. And, and we're going to try to work to solve these issues. So that's just a little snippet about who I am. And I look forward to sharing more with all of the panelists. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Assemblywoman Murphy. Uh, thank you, Elisa. And uh, welcome to my colleagues uh, for joining us today. Um, you know, I see there's a lot of people out there and I hope that more and more women and girls will um, take advantage of programs like Alice Paul. I am Assemblywoman Carol Murphy, uh, Deputy Majority Leader, um, and Valina Jackson and Gabby, uh, Assemblywoman Mascara, sorry, sorry, Assemblywoman, and Assemblywoman Dunn. We have worked together um, on a bipartisan level as women um, in the legislature. So I wanted to let everyone know that it's such a pleasure to work with them. Assemblywoman Mascara used to be my boss a few years back, and um, it was such a pleasure to work with her. I ended up in the legislature myself. So I am um, the vice chair of the judiciary in the assembly. I'm also on the budget committee along with uh, three other committees that I sit on. But in addition to that, I, were, I am a board member of Alice Paul Institute. And um, it gives me such great pleasure, not only as a board member, but also being able to attend a lot of these programs um, that highlight significant endeavors that women do. Um, I'm also part of the Girl Scouts. I'm a delegate for Burlington County, along with a member of the Girl Scouts. I also sit on the Council for Humanities, which I was just put on um, in January, and that's a fantastic committee as well. That brings a lot of programs um, to the area in New Jersey. And I'm also the state director for the National Foundation for Women Legislators for New Jersey. Um, and what does that mean? Uh, that means that um, every year, women like us, um, women like you who are watching this will get together um, as legislators and we talk about the issues that happen around the country. And we're always talking about how we can help each other um, being able to support each other, um, regardless of what state we're in. So um, that is such an important uh, feat. Um, and in addition, uh, you know, this is something that I, I'm very proud of. Um, I was invited uh, by the National Conference for State Legislatures to sit on their executive committee just recently. So um, I, I have been accepted to there. And it is great because that also allows us as women, um, for me to go in and represent us as women and say, and these are the things that we're working on in Trenton. Um, and these are the things that we're working on in New Jersey. I live in Mount Laurel, which is the home of Alice Paul Institute. Um, I represent 17 towns in Burlington uh, County and the other, um, the other 17 towns are divided between two other districts. And it is uh, such a great pleasure to be here. And I look forward to talking with each and every one of you. I will also put in the chat, but Alyssa does have it. So does the uh, Alice Paul have all of our contact information. And I urge you to reach out to me, reach out to um, Assemblywoman J Jackson, reach out to Assemblywoman Dunn, reach out to Assemblywoman Mascara as we move forward. If you want more information on what we're doing, um, and I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, back over to Alyssa. Thank you so much, Carol, or Assemblywoman Murphy, my apologies. Uh, Assemblywoman Dunn, if you'd like to introduce yourself now. Need to unmute. <laughs> thank you, Alyssa, it really, and thank you to the Alice Paul Institute for having me. Uh, this is really a pleasure. You know, it's, uh, we're, 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 so we have celebrated the 100th year of a woman's right to vote, and now we're in Women's History Month. And uh, like Assemblywoman Murphy said, all, all four of us here on this panel, uh, we, we have lots of fun together working on important issues. Uh, all of us have worked together on various bills uh, in a bipartisan way, of course. So, um, you know, again, it's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to engaging in this discussion. I'm the Assemblywoman for District 25. So I represent 21 towns, 20 of them are in Morris County. Uh, the last time Morris County, that, that, that my district uh, had a female representative was in the 1970s. Uh, 
<laughs> so uh, when I when I uh, took my oath of office on November 25th in 2019, I became the 38th female legislator, which marked the most uh, the highest number of female legislators we had for the state of New Jersey. So that was really, um, as you could tell, I have the date down. Um, I probably could even figure out the time because that will forever be etched in my memory. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, this is my first uh, elected office to hold. Um, I, I like to say I was always behind the scenes. I worked in government and nonprofits, uh, one of them being Sesame Workshop and uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I worked on early childhood education policy uh, and I've worked on uh, Capitol Hill for uh, uh, at least three members. Again, behind the scenes, right? The doer, uh, the collaborator, which we are as women, uh, those are roles that we're quite, quite yep, com comfortable with and familiar with. Uh, but when my boss said he was retiring, I said, what does that mean for me? wait, I'm not ready to retire. <laughs> so I pushed myself from behind the scenes out front. Um, and I really, I hope more women do that because it's, it's really an extension of what they've been doing their whole lives, I'm sure, advocating, uh, putting, you know, bringing people together, facilitating important conversations. So um, I'm happy to be bringing that to the legislature. And mind you, along the way, you know, not everyone said I should. Do it. As a matter of fact, along the way, there are plenty of people that said, no, uh, you shouldn't do it. So, um, and I know all of us here on this panel, and I'm sure in the audience have, could, would, could talk about those experiences. So again, I really thank you for all your work and what you're doing to make positive change in the world for women. And I look forward to speaking with the, the audience. Well, thank you all of you so much. Um, so just so everyone who's here understands what's about to happen, um, we're going to have a conversation. Please send, I've seen a few questions and generally I will probably do questions from our audience towards the end, unless they really dovetail into the conversation we're having, but that can make it a little easier um, with a format like this. So what I'm going to do is ask some questions of our panelists and just invite um, whoever would like to begin um, with the answer, whoever just, uh, and then you can all dialogue with each other. And um, if I have, if there are any questions that feel really prescient in the moment, I might hop in and ask those as well. So my first question is this, um, evidence based on roll call votes at every level of government suggests that politicians better address the needs of people whose identities they share. Um, however, at every level of government, we see that 65 to 75 percent of all elected officials are male. And when I say every level, I mean starting with town council, school boards, like all the way up through, you know, Congress. We just we see that. So in your experience, what kinds of policy priorities shift when women gain seats in government? Oh, okay. I'll <laughs> uh, um, what first comes to mind is um, it may not even be a policy shift, but when we take up a policy that we can all agree on that's, that's a priority, women bring a different perspective uh, and, and address things that may have not ordinarily been dress, addressed otherwise in that piece of legislation or that policy proposal. Uh, and it's bringing, uh, you know, what I see is mainly always bringing that full perspective for women, children, um, you know, the, the, um, uh, how we, how we care for others is often, uh, you know, what we, what we bring to that discussion. No, I, I agree with that because my, my whole thing is this, and this is how I like to compare between having men in, in, in any kind of field, but a lot has to do with government as well. Um, so if you put a man and a woman together, if you ask a man, what is, what is the biggest thing that they're working on? Um, and you ask them to describe it, they would say, I'm looking straight ahead at what we need to get done. Uh -huh. But if you ask a woman what, they're look, what, what it is that they're working on, they're gonna say, look, I'm looking all around me to make sure everything gets done. Uh -huh. And I think, I think when we talk about that change, um, we talk about the idea that um, 
like like Aurora said, that it isn't about the policy change. It's about the amount of policy that gets done and the vision of that policy changes. Not so much the the issue, but just the vision for it and where it comes, where it actually um, starts at. And I do truly believe this um, with all my heart is that if women were at the table for everything, <laughs> we may have solved the world's problems. <laughs> I, I really believe that because we have, like, like we say, is that women tend to encompass everything and we think of everything, maybe not to the satisfaction of men, but us women would be able to leave it, be able to live quite comfortably with us being able to resolve everything we need to get done at the moment. I think when women gain uh, seats in government, we drill down a lot further than uh, men do. Like logistically, how is this supposed to operate? I think we uplift a lot of those um, programs, entrepreneurial, whether it's childcare, maternal health, uh, transportation, like those support efforts that you know, we think about because our scope and our vision is just much wider than theirs. So I believe that, you know, our, our ability to accomplish a lot more, my, a lot, I want to say more comprehensive than if we're not at the table. We begin to add different variables into it and, and have those deeper conversations about how is the, how are logistics, how the hell is that going to get done? So I, I, that's what, that's my perspective when women are added to the, to government. And then just to um, just to add to what the assemblywoman said, it's I have like two perfect examples. Um, one being uh, affordable childcare. That's something that talks about, you know, knows about that there's like the childcare is completely uh, unaffordable in the state or even across the country. But it actually uh, took a pandemic for it to be in the forefront. However, in 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 my committee and in the state, we've been talking about this for quite some time, but it took a pandemic to make it like a, a big deal. And now everybody's talking about it, which is a good thing. That's number one. Another example is maternal health. Now, something that there have been experts been talking about maternal health for years, but it wasn't, not, it wasn't until women in the state legislature and then also the administration with the current administration here in the state of New Jersey, driving that conversation that people actually took notice. And that's what I guess what, what this question is about is it's, yeah, it's, it's something that everything people know about, maybe it's been talked about a little bit here and there, but when women come to the table and women get elected, it drives that conversation even further and makes it, and it's the force that makes it, you know, it makes it to the forefront of the conversation and let people know this is important and this is what we need to talk about and this is what we have to do to resolve it. So that's my two cents. No, I, I think that's great. And there's one thing, so I'm gonna, cause, cause I am such a geek and I can't help myself. So I have, when I got on the board of Alice Paul working with them, um, one of the things that I did was start looking at all of her quotes and all of the things that she did and all of the articles. And because it was such inspiring, especially this past year that we had the hundredth anniversary of the uh, uh, women's suffrage movement. And one of the things that I hope all of you will agree with me that pertains to even today, but this is what she said. She goes, I never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, most problems are complicated, but to me, there's nothing complicated about ordinary equality. And I think as we start talking about the shift in policy and comparing to what men and women um, do, I think it's the idea that we as women have been ignored for a while, that that really, I don't think there's that understanding of what we can do um, out there. And there's a little bit of fear of what we can do out there by our male counterparts. Um, and as long as I think all four of us are um, a representative of what we represent in the legislature for women, I think we're going to continue um, empowering each other and fighting with each other to make sure that we are taken seriously, that we are noticed, and that our work is equally important as to the men. And hopefully that will lead to more women being able to get elected in New Jersey. So I um, just 
pointing back to what Assemblewoman Mosquera was saying, talking about maternal health, I've been learning a lot recently about um, First Lady Murphy's Nurture New Jersey initiative. And just to kind of emphasize what you were saying about women taking these things seriously, although the data is there, when um, Governor Murphy took office, New Jersey had been, was, and it still is, 45th in the nation in terms of maternal health outcomes. And I, I believe the number was 37 out of every 100,000 um, births, there are 37 women who die in New Jersey. And the United States doesn't have a great record for that, but even though we're a state with so many resources, um, we didn't have a great record on that. And it took, you know, like you were saying, women collaborating in the government, collaborating with the administration to really start trying to affect systemic change to address those issues. Um, one of, we had a question that I think kind of does dovetail really nicely, especially with what Assemblywoman Murphy was just saying, you know, quoting Alice Paul, which we love to do around here, of course. Um, but um, Barbara Trout said that we've been learning so much about bills and legislatures in many states to change voting rules. And if wondering about any bills on voting rights that have been, um, uh, her language is dropped in the hopper in New Jersey. And I know that voting access is something that does affect women um, historically and to the present day, sometimes more dis disparately than men. Okay. Uh, we, well, we, go ahead. I was going to say women are, we're at, we're, we are make up the largest population, but yet times, and I think we talked about it in terms of all that we do, sometimes we're not able to get there. And so when you start to aggregate what that data is, when you can't get there, um, it definitely becomes significant. But once we there, once we are a part of the voting block, you can see it. You see in the data that women are really the ones that are transforming the, the legislature or transforming who gets elected and that's why they pay so much attention to us and so i think as we move forward um when we so first started talking off about women in government you know we are all the women that all started out behind the scenes but we have to continue to encourage those sometimes you are the person that has to be the candidate but there's so many opportunities out there so that we can try to uh help other women gain their voice in the process and i think you know when we look at uh women's issues, whether we're talking about pay, especially pay equity, that's something that can get a woman to say, listen, I'm going to the polls. We have a lot of options right now in terms of vote by mail, early voting. Um, all of these things are going to definitely increase more of our participation. And I can't wait for our numbers to continue to rise. This is going to be exciting. Absolutely. And early voting is, a, is a, uh, it's on the table now to talk about. Um, but I think what to just uh, piggyback on the assemblywoman is that we as uh, women, we take this, um, we make sure that we, we, our names are on the ballots. We make sure that our names are on the petitions. Um, I just had a petition signing this morning I attended um, and the majority of people at the petition signing for our county was women as of the time I left there. So they're the first ones that answer the call. And you know what, it goes back to what we said earlier is that um, don't accept no. As a woman, don't accept no, you can't get on. You can't get on. And I think uh, some of women done said the same thing. Don't, don't accept no, you gotta, you gotta say yes, this is where we're gonna go. Don't ask for permission to put yourself on a ballot. Um, put yourself on the ballot, um, work with your party if, you know, if that's where it leads to, but don't, don't accept no um, as you move forward. I think we have, um, as women, we tend to, in the past, have, have accepted that word, no, it's not your turn yet. And as we're learning, especially um, talking to a lot of the women in the caucus, you know, we, we're tired of hearing no. So just to um, add that, I guess one of the most important things in regards to voting in the state of New Jersey, as was mentioned, and I'll just reiterate, is a bill that addresses early voting in the state of New Jersey. Um, that is something that I, I believe that it was passed um, with the significant support. And, and it is true that as Americans, it, the most important thing that we can do as Americans is vote. And we stand as women and the women that are here, we stand on the shoulders of Alice Paul who fought hard for us to get the right to vote. And so it is uh, important for us 
to follow in that legacy, to follow in that sacrifice, to recognize the sacrifice that all those women that came before us, the, the, the humiliation, the, 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 the disrespect, all that, they all did that because they believed that women had the right to vote. So in the name of Alice Paul, voting is something that as women is the most powerful tool we have, is the most powerful voice that we have. And as legislators, we can use that voice that help us to get here to amplify the, the uh, issues that are important in our society, issues that are important to our women, issues that are important to our children and families as a whole. So that's what I wanted to add. So one of the biggest things here that, that we're currently have dealt with in the last recent weeks is getting uh, early voting um, passed. And I would just, I, I, well, thank you, Assemblywoman Mascara, that was so eloquent and inspiring. And I, I just, um, I, won't, I won't be as inspiring. I just wanted to add um, that uh, back to, you know, in terms of how do we enhance voting access uh, for everyone and um, helping that improve women's input. Um, back to what Assemblywoman Reynolds Jackson said earlier about how we are more operational and we drill down, you know, so I think we really need to look at our election uh, process here in the state of New Jersey, what's and what what we could be improving, what needs um, fixing. You know, and, and boy, did the pandemic uh, bring a lot of that to light, right? As we went to an all vote by mail uh, process um, and the questions, I mean, we really, I'm sure each and every one of us on this panel, we, we basically became, you know, we, we had to be educators on, for our constituents on, uh, you know, how this election's gonna work and how you'll be able to participate. So we learned a lot and I think we need to really take those lessons so we can improve access and make sure that we provide the, I, you know, I believe the fullest set of options for citizens to have their voice heard. Thank you so much for all of those answers. That was so insightful and far ranging. Um, Assemblywoman Mosquera actually anticipated my next question a little bit when she was talking earlier about the things the pandemic has brought into relief and kind of forced into public conversation. And um, so the question, my qu next question is, the pandemic has forced into the open another version of that famous problem with no name. Women have been asked to become teachers, maintain their homes, take care of children, be the emotional pillars of their families, and somehow still work full time. Um, the toll of this is in the data. Over 2 million women left the workforce in 2020. So um, I was hoping you all could speak to the ways in which policies allowed this to happen and how woman-centric governance could have avoided some of these costs or could help remedy them moving forward. Wow, that's a, that's a, that's a lot. So um, I'll start this one off. Um, right after the pandemic first started, first of all, the pandemic has um, brought a lot of issues to the forefront for us as a nation, let alone us as a state, as us as um, residents of the state of New Jersey, from healthcare all the way to education needs, all the way up to um, our workforce. And right after the pandemic started, it was about, I don't know, a couple months into it, I saw on Good Morning America a story of which a woman um, who was working from home and she was in the corporate world, um, and her kids were younger, they were toddlers, so they were running around and she was trying to maintain balance with her kids, all of which women who have children understand this because like you said, we're, we're expected to um, you know, be teachers, maintain our homes, and again, encompass the whole bigger picture. Um, she ended up getting fired uh, from it, from her job because of her lack of 100% attention to the client and um, trying to do everything while still being on Zoom. So I, I saw the story and then I read somebody in New Jersey, this happened to a young woman in New Jersey, the same thing. So I immediately um, called my, my staff at the time and told them to, institute, to put in a bill that would make protections for the women workforce who have to work at home because of 
whatever it's a health emergency, whatever the case may be, especially during this uh, pandemic, um, which we put that out there. And that goes to show that uh, every single woman I know of, um, when things like this and they read stories and they, they are a big con a contribution to the policies that we do that protect women, especially being a mother um, and being a caregiver and being a, a person of, who takes care of their home. I think these are the type of policies that we need to start paying attention to because these are the protections that women need. Because um, like you said, 2020, a lot of women lost their jobs only because of not able, of other people understanding that there are things at home that they need to do while still conducting a Zoom. Um, and it was being efficiently done. So, you know, that's, I hope that kind of uh, spurs you on to what you were asking. And then just to add to what Assemblywoman Murphy basically stated was that this pandemic basically um, highlighted a lot of holes uh, in, in our society that we have taken for granted. Uh, certain things is now that, now that the, there's, it's great that we, there are women that can work from home, but then there are other issues where the issues with childcare, the issues of you know, not being able to concentrate 100% on, on your work and then try to, you know, part that and then trying to, you know, take care of, of your children. So that's, that's a, a big issue that the Assemblywoman um, talked about. And, you know, these are things, again, it's something that as a society pre-pandemic, we would never even think about or even talked about, but it's something that now um, post-pandemic or, or during this pandemic, um, we have to talk about, we have to look at, at this issue that's very important because God knows what's going to happen in the next couple of years. And I mean, it's, it's, it's time for us to, to have this conversation of being, you know, the allowing families and especially women in the workforce give that flexibility, that work flexibility um, and see how, you know, we, they can meet expectations of family and, and work life. There has to be some type of balance, which again, was never really talked about prior to uh, the pandemic because everybody just took it for granted. Everybody went to work, everybody came home, you know, everybody went, you know, uh, took their children to, to daycare or they took their children to school. And that was basically, everybody lived in like little boxes, but now with the pandemic, everything just ran, you know, just meshed all together and, and everybody's in the same home and trying to figure the, the day out is, can be very complex. But yeah, I mean, these are things that we have to talk about and there's, there's going to be a new way of living because of this pandemic um, that we have to be very conscious about and uh, focused on and also just uh, trying to figure out the, the, where we can have a balance with, you know, our, as women in our careers, uh, you know, even, even women employers, what are we going to be doing? Uh, for our workforce. So this is something that we, we need to definitely um, drive uh, the, the conversation and talk about. If I, oh, I, if I could just add, I'm, I'm very pleased and proud to, to serve on the committee uh, that Assemblywoman Mascara chairs, uh, Women and Children. And, um, you know, I remember we had that, we had a pretty lengthy hearing on child care uh, which was such an important discussion. And I, I think what, what, real, what came through was, you know, the recognition of how much women drive this economy and contribute to the economy. You know, we talk about economic health, right, throughout this whole pandemic. Um, and, you know, prior to that, to that discussion, really, I felt the media was focusing on uh, tra public transportation as the main piece on how we're going to get people to work how we're going to keep that environment safe and and all that public transportation contributes to the economy right well child care <laughs> we finally were able to to bring that on the forefront of and of course we know it's primarily women owned right it's a it's a primarily uh, women's sector um and how how much that drives the economy and i do hope that we keep that we keep that as the the top top issue you know we don't we don't um slide back when things go back to normal and we are going back into our routines. Uh, so again, I just, I just focus on, you know, that, that we need to emphasize that how critical women are to, 
for the economy and women who choose to stay home. And I, I say choose, right? If they're blessed with that choice to be able to, to stay home, uh, how much they still are contributing to the economy, uh, even though you can't, you can't quantify that, obviously. Um, although I have heard, I think we're up to $250,000 a year uh, if you were to translate that salary into a salary. Well, listen, if you think about a homemaker and all that she does, she is the major head of the corporation. I mean, you know, that 250000 You there are some households that could not function without this homemaker. So I absolutely agree with you, Assemblywoman Dunn. And I think we have to, I saw in the chat, someone said, you know, uh, some in cultures, um, men aren't on the same hierarchy, right? And I, But then I thought about, well, look at how um, maternity care has also been extended to men as well. You know, they want to be there but if there's no pathway then you know they go to work and then it's the the shift goes back to to mom but i also think about just in terms of um, our elder population i don't know if you have brothers or sisters or where you fall at in terms of you know uh, women and men, but oftentimes it shifts to the woman as being the care care provider. And, you know, I, I know I have two older brothers and I definitely involve them in the conversation. I'm usually stare, spearheading the conversation, but it's, um, it's about all of us taking care of our mom. It's not just on the weight of my shoulders. And so I think we have to also begin those dialogues to say, it's okay. You know, you can take mom to the doctors. It's okay. You can take her to the grocery store. You know, it's it's about making it a collective thing and not being allowing them to be passive in this role and making it and shifting that conversation and shifting that environment so that women and men um, men are able to contribute more um, than they currently do right now. So that that's the, the my my two cents on that one. I, I think um, we have to make sure we spearhead the conversation. Absolutely. And, I, and I'll just follow up with that. You know, there are a lot of men out there that support women. There's a lot of men in, the, in, in society that empowers women to do what we do. Um, and thank you to those men who, who do that. Um, because, you know, behind every successful man, they say is a woman. So let me tell you, um, I think that holds true today. Um, and I um, by the way, we do support your economy. My best friend is Amazon. I get that delivered to my house every friggin' day. And my husband's telling me another Amazon package. So I don't know about you ladies, but um, I'm constantly um, using Zoom. I mean, uh, using the pandemic as a reason to keep buying Amazon. So I'm actually going to detour a little bit from the questions we had prepared because I've seen a number of questions come up from our attendees about the issue of sexism and, you know, gender perspectives. So um, Joyce Campbell said that many people would say sexism no longer exists, but I know I still deal with it in the workplace. What has your experience been with sexism in government as government workers? And Allison Tittman asked, how do you ensure that your male colleagues understand the necessity of legislation that primarily targets the needs of women? Do they adequately understand the inequality that still exists or do you find yourselves having to provide education in order to increase their willingness to be your allies? Do you have to work to justify legislation that centers the needs of women? I think we're all thinking about this one. <laughs> I don't think it's, uh, well, for me, I know uh, ageism is is another one, um, as well as sexism. You know, there, I've been in spaces where, you know, I've been called sweetie or, um, um, you know, uh, uh, youngin or, 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 you know, those type of names. And I'm, I'm not there as the secretary. I'm there representing the corporation. And so when you have these dialogues and you're like, oh no, I'm here to vote. I'm here to be a part of the conversation. I'm here to develop the contract. Oh no, we're negotiating. It becomes a different theme. And it's like, 
Oh, I, I apologize. But I think, you know, this is another reason why we need to make sure that women are at the table, making sure that you, you know, you, you, you um, acknowledge it. And then you also have a, a chance, as, as Nancy Pelosi says, you, you clap back and, and you, you move forward. But it's, it's out there. It's, it's, it's real today. And I'm sure um, others have had some similar experiences too. And in terms of justifying the legislation, I think in maternal health, health, the data um, has really been to our best practice. And, you know, shout out to the first lady uh, being a strong advocate for us to be able to get a lot of this legislation and funding through. So I think those type of partnerships definitely um, are a bonus for us. Yeah. And I still think, I think we have to work extra hard um, just to prove that we are serious about what we're doing and we should be taken seriously. Um, I think that's um, also true today as it was a, uh, years ago, you know, before getting into government, um, into the political world, working for members, I was at schools construction um, and we, we built schools around the state of New Jersey and I did communication. So I got a chance to actually see sexism at its finest um, at that time. We were talking about it years ago, but I think as we're starting to come up, we've come a long way not far enough, we still have a lot of work to do. But last year, we just got a woman vice president um, elected. And it wasn't, it wasn't because that no one took her seriously, it was because everybody took her seriously. Um, we got her elected. We have a Lieutenant Governor in the state of New Jersey, Sheila Oliver, who is a woman, a former speaker of the New Jersey Assembly. Women are making strides um, and there's a lot more we can do. And I think there's a lot of places that we can continue striving for. But one of the things that I would like to see us do as women while we're creating a path for people behind us is letting our younger generation run past us with all of this. Um, run to the fact that they're going to play an important part in a hierarchy as we carve that way as a present generation for our future. Well, that um, dovetails really nicely with our next question. Thank you. So the election of 2020, as we've been discussing and all know, was groundbreaking for women in many ways. And we still have very far to go. There are 20 states in America that have never had a woman governor, 17 states who have never had a woman senator, and four that have never sent a woman to the House of Representatives. What are your dreams and aspirations in terms of the future of women in governance in America at all levels and what needs to change for that to be realized? So I'm gonna jump in with this one. Um, I actually, we've seen a lot of change uh, in, in this country, uh, slow, but it, it has been uh, changing. Um, we saw not too long ago, we had a Senator Clinton running for office. Uh, then this last, uh, around the last presidential election, we had a few women that were actually on the campaign trail to get the nomination to be the president, the next president of the United States. That is absolutely something that we should be proud of. Uh, we should be proud of that we elected the first female vice president. You know, that, I mean, as a, as a mother of two daughters, I am very proud that we are seeing that. Um, again, and I have to go back to, you know, it wouldn't, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the sacrifices of the women that came before us back as early as uh, the 1800s uh, with, you know, women knowing in their hearts that they're just not just property and that they have the right to vote and fighting for that and keep fighting for that. And we'll always will be fighting to be taken seriously, um, that we're worth uh, to, and, and that, we're, that we have value. Um, it's going to be, it's an uphill battle. It's always been an uphill battle. Um, and, but we, we, have the, we have the fortitude. Uh, we're women, you know? We, we, we've been <laughs> elected to, to give birth. And every, I mean, and women that have, you know, given birth that are on this panel, and and those that are listening uh, or viewing the, this webinar know 
that that's the hardest thing to do. Um, and being a mom is a really hard job. It's a, it's a wonderful gift that we're given. But if, um, you know, if we can do that, I think we can, we can run a country. And, um, and it's because of these uh, women that I believe, and in my heart, I really do, that the, the, the future is bright for women. Um, this is just a first step uh, of many steps. And I, I honestly believe that those states that have not seen any female leadership will one day see it. It's just they have, uh, they, they just have to be women willing to take the risk and willing to step up and say, I am here, I am ready to run. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna be the voice of my community. And that's what we have to encourage is give the, um, the ability, that encouragement to, and confidence uh, to, to women. I'll, I'll tell you a little story about myself that I didn't get to do in, <clears throat> in, the, in the intro. I I'm always consider myself an introvert. I'm a quiet person. And t like 10 years ago, e even longer than that, if you, uh, if you have asked me, would you have ever run for office? I'll be absolutely not, because that's just not my personality. But I was given the opportunity to do it. And I did it, fearful and all, but I did it. And it was the best decision I have made. It was hard work. And it's a lot of dedication, a lot of sacrifice. It's not easy. And being an elected official is not for the faint hearted. You have to have thick skin, trust me. But as a person, as, as self-identified as an introvert, um, it's something that you learn. It's a skill that you learn. And every day you get stronger. And I believe that all of us here, all, all my colleagues, it's every day that we confront a, a challenge or a conflict or anything like that, we learn from it and we get stronger. So I, one of the things that I would like to see change is the ability to give women the confidence that they can run for office. They can do it. If I can do it, who is a very quiet person by nature, <laughs> um, anyone can. I so totally agree. I am such an introvert. And, um, you know, I, again, I, I think I said it at the top. Um, if you would have ever asked me, it's not something that I would have done. But as a woman, you know, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired and you're like totally like you just live it, you're like, Okay. And it's not that I'm just going to sit here and be mad. I'm going to be strategic about it. And so that was my story, uh, Assemblywoman. I was, I was so disgustingly disappointed in my council person who wouldn't return my calls, who wouldn't shake my hand, who would not even acknowledge me. And I was like, listen, I'm the social worker. I know how this is supposed to be done, but this is, and if you're treating me this way, the resource person, I can't imagine how you treat somebody else. And I call, you know, 10 times, the average person isn't going to call and call and call and call. They're going to give up. And so that's why you have so many obstacles in, in, in the way. But I do take with me what you said is that if I can do it, you can do it. You know, that self-determination is so there. And I just want to continue to encourage girls and women to use your voice. I know if I, if I had to tell my younger self that I would definitely say, speak up more, um, what you're thinking, everybody else is thinking, and nobody knows what's on your paper. <laughs> you can say what you want. You can make mistakes. Nobody knows. It's okay. And, and just keep moving forward. But if you're passionate about it, if this is what you want to do, in whatever field, whether it's teaching, whether it's in business, whether you're a lawyer, we didn't go into the statistics of lawyers, you know, in, in the in the courts and how women are just at the bottom of the totem pole, but we have to continue to fight. We have to continue to put our names out there. We have to continue to push and say, listen, the data says you only have one person, one woman on your executive board, or you only have one person on your foundation or one person on your corporate. You know, I'm interested. 
put yourself out there, be vulnerable um, and just go for it. I think, you know, I, I thank you so much for sharing that because sometimes people think this is easy for us and it's not, it's very hard, but you know, again, I feel like if I'm able to encourage someone else, they, they, plus me will equal a win. And so that's what we have to continue to do is uplift one another. And I would add to that because often we're only, we may be the only woman in the room. So it's important to make sure we have that network even outside that we, we touch base with, that we check in with, because, you know, you could be in that moment where you're like, am I the only one thinking it? Usually you are, but you know, if you check back with your, your fellow female colleagues, they, they'd be right there with you. Um, but if I could just add one story, because again, I mentioned earlier that I'm new to politics, uh, new to running for office, and um, I have three children. Uh, my girls are away at college, but my youngest son, um, he really has been able to observe this political life the most, right? Because he's still home and he's with me and I, you know, he helps with making lawn signs and all that good stuff. But um, I have learned so much through his lens. Uh, we were watching the uh, presidential, um, uh, the, the uh, primary debates and there was a, one, there was a woman candidate and he turned to me and he said, you know, mom, I really like her. I, I like her. Like what she has to say is making a lot of sense. She could really help this country. And he said, but she sounds like a teacher. <laughs> and I said, well, do you think teachers could be presidents? And he's like, I hadn't thought about it, but yeah, teachers like they, you can't, you don't skip out. They, they know what every student's doing <laughs> and they have to teach to every kid's level. Um, and they're so organized, you know, and I thought there it begins, right? If we start, we see more women in office and bringing something different that doesn't fit that mold, uh, we are gonna, we're, we're gonna change the world. Uh, and, you know, and it, but for our boys and girls, um, and I, I know there's, uh, I've heard an interesting statistic on NPR that where you see companies that have the most women in leadership, they tend to, if the, if the you know, it's just a male CEO, uh, if you dig down, they are typically fathers of daughters. So um, I, I just, I think all those, we've, we got we have to bring the men along too, to recognize uh, the, the value that we add. And again, of course, the importance of actually seeing women in that role. So we've had a question and that asked, where do you look for support when you're running, especially when you're surrounded by men as women? I'll just add, I think family number one, right? We've got to, we, <laughs> if you, you've got to have that family support and they, that, you know, I think even when they go in, they're not even fully aware of all the sacrifices that are going to be made. Uh, but they believe in you, and they and they see that you, um, you know, you're living out your passion. And really, many or you know, I in many ways I feel like I've been called to do this, um, and they're there for you. But that that's first and foremost. Um, and you have to be you have to be cognizant of that too. Like I I realize I bring a lot of my if you, what do you do what do we do with family right when we come home we debrief at the day and we sometimes t talk about the the toughest moments we had right the negative aspect of it. Um, so I'm very you know aware of that to make sure you know I have to talk about the positive and even when we're going through some of the hard hardships that we're talking about it's for because it's for a greater good. And to always bring it back to that, like what what our cause and purpose is, uh, to inspire people for you know to to not just um, be disenfranchised, you know, or you know not have distrust for their political leaders. Um, yeah, I also I think it also goes back to you know we find we do have men who support us in um, outside of our home as well, and I think if we we tend to um, migrate towards that community of people who are supportive to us. Um, but I think also we find, at least I do, I find a lot of support um, within myself as well. Um, standing up and saying, you know what, I can do this regardless of what Tom, Dick or Harry is saying to me that I can't, 
or I'm not going to accept no, because I know this is what I want to do. I know this is the right thing to do. Uh, or saying to myself, this is going to be um, the best thing I've ever done. And I think if you're able to to create that positivity within yourself and empowering yourself to be to be a strong individual and put yourself on that rung of hierarchy, um, despite what the naysayers say. And I think that that is so important. And in the meantime, people are going to see that um, whether they think you're um, whether they think you're right for the job or not, they're going to respect the fact that you are moving forward. And that's one step at a time, um, making making everybody realize that we are we are important and we can be the voice of reason when it comes to um, politics. So I guess just to add that a uh, family is important. Self-reliance is also important. Being your own support system is extremely important. And that is actually, if, so, if you can do that, that is a, a skill uh, that uh, you've been gifted with because it's so hard to find that inner strength. Sometimes uh, you know, you don't believe in yourself enough, but there has to be something within you that pulls you from that uh, thinking, pulls you up, you know, and makes you believe that, yes, you can, you can do this. So that's very important. And the thing I would like to add also is if, if you're lucky to have mentors, uh, they are a great wealth of resource um, and um, also have um, great knowledge and, and wisdom to, to give you. I've been very fortunate to have mentors, one of them actually being um, Senator Cruz Perez, who I um, talk to a, a lot. And uh, she, when she found out that I was running for office, she said to me, you can do this. You can absolutely do this. When I didn't think I could, but she said, you can do this. So she was my, uh, my strength. And I, I owe a lot to her. Um, she is, has been one of the leading forces um, and, a, and is a light uh, in, in my life in regards to just my political career. And we're very fortunate to have her uh, here in, in the state of New Jersey. And she's a wonderful Senator representing the fifth legislative district. So I'm very grateful to not only uh, consider her a, a mentor, but she's, she was also my former boss as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, so if you have, if you have mentors, people that you can trust, people that you can talk to outside, of course, your family, outside of yourself, um, yeah, having someone to, to bounce ideas, um, and someone to talk to, or when you're just a vent, um, uh, someone to help you just to lift you up when you're having a bad day to encourage you, then that is, um, that's a wonderful thing. And then you're very fortunate. I, I have to agree, and, and uh, mentors are great. Um, I don't pretend to know everything, and I also think that self-reflection um, is also good. Um, and we've said it, all, all, the, all the assembly women on this call has said it, this this uh, politics is can be very dirty, it can be grimy, it can be hurtful, um, and so you have to know how to balance that emotion that you feel um, in those moments. But it, it does thank God it doesn't last long, but you have to, you know, have some type of release. And so, you know, whether you do shopping like Carol, I'm a runner. Um, so I do a lot of running. I try to do meditation. I try to do a lot of things just to, to be active in, in my lifestyle, my lifestyle change, I should say, because I'm always shifting to something else. Um, but I believe that that emotional um, self-support is, is just so very, very important so that you can love on you. Who else loves you more than you? And so when you go through these good days, bad days, you know, I try to make sure I can point out something that I like for the day because sometimes I can have 10 to one and, you know, who wants... Uh, First of all, I don't sleep well if, if I have too much on my mind, even if I write it down, I try all these other things. So I have to reflect back on what makes me feel good, what makes me happy, and what are some of those go strategic goals that I can do to, to have achievements so that I'm not so bogged down. And talking to a mentor is definitely helpful because, you know, sometimes they've been down that road um, and they're able to offer you some light and some support. Um, and then sometimes, you know, a mentor is also great because that 
that's not your cheerleader. They're, they tell you if it's right or wrong or, you know, their opinion about the situation. So, you know, and it's like, you know, you're out in public and it's all good. But when we get back to the car on the ride home, it's like, um, let's, let's have a conversation about that. So I think, you know, to have a good mentor that has that yin and yang is, is just a perfect balance. And you can have more than one, right? So you have different industries, different fields, different careers. It's okay. You can have more than one. I think, um, you know, for me, I have a, a close inner circle because I, I just, I'm, I don't talk about a lot of things. And so I have to figure out, you know, I guess probably so who, who's going to be more on my side. <laughs> Do I really want to hear the truth? Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's all good to be able to talk about it so that it's not so, um, um, heavy on you, um, as you go through these cycles. Thank you all. That just that kind of advice is so helpful. Just hearing other people talk about what encourages them is so encouraging. Um, we are coming up on the end of our time, but I do have one question I would like to um, ask you to leave us all with um, your thoughts on today. And that is, what do you think gender parity in the New Jersey legislature could accomplish? Oh, Assemblywoman Dunn, I think you were muted, but it looked like you were coming to respond. Well, I was first, I was first repeating your question so I could let it sink in and, and think about it. Um, I think, you know, what I, what I set out to do is to make New Jersey affordable. And, uh, you know, so people want to stay here, can stay here, live here, play here, work here. Uh, that, and that includes grandparents, right? And we know how critical they've been uh, this time around. Many of them have become virtual uh, school teachers or after school program counselors. Uh, so uh, really, so, we, you know, it's rooted in keeping the family together. Um, and I think, uh, again, it kind of goes full circle to how we opened this panel and this discussion, bringing in those, the women's perspective or coming at it from a different angle, um, we can achieve those goals. Because I, 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 don't, I don't think when I say making New Jersey an affordable, affordable is, a, is a novel goal. <laughs> but um, I think we'd have more success at reaching our goals, truly, uh, to your question about what would gender parity bring. And at a faster rate. We know, uh, thanks to your statistics on the number of bills that uh, women or uh, legislators are, the rate at which they're successful when once they're in the legislature. I know. I think it's worth repeating, though, because right now, New Jersey's ranked 20th in terms of women in New Jersey legislature. 19 out of 40 in the Senate. 27 out of 80 in the assembly, which is only 38% of the legislature are women. So when we talk about uh, gender parity, I think when we have more women at the table, we have better legislation. And I think we could push more civic engagement and we could influence more women to run for office. And whether that's in public office, in private sector, in unions, what in your church, where your synagogue, your, you know, wherever you go, I think the more more we have more voices of women in leadership, the more women can see themselves in those roles. And, that, and then we can begin to uh, bridge those equality, inequality gaps. Now, and, and like, you, like you said, with those numbers, I think you know, we're, we're losing a female senator. First of all, let me go back to what we were talking about before we got on this, was that um, we've lost two women since 2019 in the numbers. We were at 38, we're now at uh, 36 in the legislature. And after this year, um, we'll be having one more Senator, a longtime uh, Senator Weinberg retiring, um, who has been an institution within, for us women within the legislature. But three of our assembly women, um, which I think is great, is moving up to run in the Senate and to become senators. So while that is looking to increase, we now have to make sure that we, we also increase our numbers in the assembly. And um, that the one thing I can say, and I think we're 
all four, all five, everybody on this call is a perfect example of us working together to highlight the impact that women have, uh, not only in the legislature, but around the state of New Jersey. And as we look to start filling those seats of women who are moving up or retiring, we're looking to replace them with more women, um, women who want the job, women who want to um, make that difference and be a public, the ultimate, and I think it's go back to what something when Mascara said in the beginning, the ultimate sacrifice of, of being a public servant, because it you do not get kudos every single day. You do not get pats on the back. It's quite discouraging. You have to be in this for all the right reasons. And that is because you want to make the difference for others to live here, um, including other women. Thank you all so much. We are really right at the end of our time. I, oh, Assemblyman Mascara, please go right ahead. Now, I was just going to just to, to finish up, just to echo exactly what Assemblyman Murphy basically said. Um, I mean, it's, it's a long road, but it's not an impossible road. And I think that uh, working together as women, we can drive the message that, uh, that you know, gender parity is important uh, and that we have to still work on, on it. But, uh, and we have to also let our, our male counterparts, our colleagues know how important it is. And it's the only way to do this is to uh, encourage more women uh, to come to the table, to encourage more women to run, to vote. So um, just my last pitch is, you know, if there's anyone here that is viewing this webinar, who's interested in, in running or considering or thinking about it, do it. I mean, it doesn't have to start uh, in the state level, but also just your local school board. That's uh, extremely important. Uh, your town council, uh, extremely important. Um, but uh, do it because um, you'll never know where it can lead you. Um, I have known many uh, females and uh, colleagues that, uh, I mean, everybody comes from very fascinating backgrounds. You start out with the school board and then they end up in, in, in the state senate or in the state assembly. Um, so. It, it's a long road, but it's not an impossible road. Um, and I do believe that um, together we can, we can do this. Again, I have to say that, you know, this is a legacy that started with uh, Alice Paul and the women like her. And um, it is our due diligence to continue with that legacy and um, see it to the end. And the only way that we can do that is to, um, provide the, the, you know, give strength to women um, and confidence that, you know, that we can do this. We can, you know, be leaders in our community. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, this has been really encouraging and inspiring for me personally. Um, it's, it can be, politics can be very overwhelming, especially recently. Um, and it's just so nice to hear a group of women talking about their hope for the future and your optimism and just your inspiring words to everyone who is here today. If you are to our attendees, um, if you were enjoying this conversation on Tuesday, March 23rd, we are hosting another panel discussion that is going to be about uh, global women in politics, political representation, and women voting around the world, and just the different state of that. And we have um, professors and experts on the topic from across the world. We have um, a woman I know from Australia at the very least, but we will also, oh, here we are, women and the vote a global perspective. So the panelists there are going to be talking about Southeast Asia and Africa and Latin America and North America and Europe just to join us for an analysis of what has been happening and what will be uh, coming in the next year. And then on March 18th, our meetup, which, is a, which instead of a webinar is actually a Zoom meeting that is conversation based for all attendees. We have our newest board members from the Nat who were formerly a part of the National Women's Party in DC who are now serving with Alice Paul Institute as we are collaborative organizations in the future. So um, I would love for all of you to join us in those. If you did not get 
your question answered today, or if you have further questions, if you look in our chat box, you will see that Tane dropped the um, information and emails for all of the assembly women who joined us today. And just now I have put the, uh, the website for the New Jersey legislature. If you are joining us from a district that wasn't represented today and would like to follow up on questions or just reach out to your representatives, you can go to njledge.state.nj.us and put your municipality and it will tell you your assembly person and how to contact them. So I strongly encourage you to do that. As I tell the teenage girls that I work with, um, you should make the staff people in your assembly person's office groan when they see your number because you call so much to make your voice heard. Also, we provide this programming for free to our community and we are a nonprofit. We would be so grateful if anyone who enjoyed this program or any other programming would make a donation to the Alice Paul Institute. That's what keeps us going. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, you can do that at our website, alicepaul.org. And again, see the email addresses for our assembly people in the chat box. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thank, thank you. you.